Hi, everyone. My name's Greg Mum, Managing Director of The Final Whistle. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to a presentation we did uh, probably about two months ago at the Massey University World in Union Sports Conference or Rugby Union Conference in New Zealand. Uh, and it really was born out of our interest to start talking about the performance benefits um, of dual pathway athletes and of athletes having a plan B alongside of their sporting careers that not only prepares them for life after spa sport but also improves their benefits, uh, sorry, their performance whilst they're uh, still competing uh, and improves their overall well-being as well. So this presentation was titled Do Dual Pathways Burst Performance Bubbles or Build Champions? You know, for, because it was a New Zealand conference uh, and a little bit of my background, you know, I'm a son of Kiwi parents, uh, a grandson of an All Black. And having not won the Bledisloe Cup now for 14 years or, or maybe even more, 15 years, you know, what was happening there and why the All Blacks have been able to create that kind of better people make better All Blacks mantra. Uh, and what was going on around performance has always been something that's fascinated me, uh, as well as my time working with universities and schools as well. Um, so we look at here, you know, they've got this, this mantra in New Zealand, and it seems to be, you know, something that's underlined their on-field performance and was of interest around how that could be applicable to other sports. You know, the reason why this question is important for us is, a couple, of, a couple of factors. One is we're approaching the saturation point of physiological measurement to improve performance. Um, so, you know, these days athletes have got their GPS data tracked almost in every session. They've got mechanical load tracked. They've got power exertion and recovery stats, uh, heart rate monitors, daily well-beings, medical checks. Um, so the p performance incrementals that we're able to get out of physical improvements are getting smaller and smaller because there's so much measured and so many uh, sports have got the same level of information there. You know, and as a coach, we used to hear that every, so much is, depends on the top six inches, but, you know, what are we actually doing to develop that in the athletes? Uh, outside of that, mental health and well-being is having a greater impact on individuals and on team performance. Uh, you know, just recently in Australia, we've seen Greg Inglis in um, in rugby league, uh, Buddy Franklin in, in, in our uh, AFL, both miss large parts of the season, a combination of injury and mental health illnesses. And, you know, obviously that has a huge impact on them as individuals, but also on their teams and on their rosters and how that affects the performance overall of the club. And lastly, there's this transition concerns. So... There's been a lot of press both globally and also locally on that this year. And uh, how can we manage um, the transition concerns of athletes around performing and succeeding in life after sport and also their mental health? So here's some statistics. And you know, being a, a New Zealand conference, it's a little bit New Zealand heavy, but it's applicable and generalizable across sports, in, in my experience anyway. And here's what we see out of the New Zealand context. We see... The average career spans nine years, um, although 78% of professional players in New Zealand now spend some time playing overseas, and most of that's at the end of their career. The average age of retirement was 32, um, and only 19% of New Zealand players felt they were well supported in their transition. Now, this is a, uh, I think this is a 2014 uh, survey, a 2013 survey. So I know the New Zealand Rugby Players Association have been working a lot on this space since then. Um, but still, you know, this is within three years. So um, on top of that, 88% of players agreed that having an education or trade is an important part of life after sport, um, with 52% of players saying they've actively studied during their career. Similar studies in Australia at Rupa and also iRupa in Ireland have said that uh, 70, between 75 and 92% of players uh, agreed that they performed better whilst having some sort of training or education going on off the field. So in preparation for this presentation, I spoke to 
a number of experts that I've come across as well as some, uh, some a couple of athletes as well. Um, Dave Hadfield has been a mental skills coach and performance coach in New Zealand uh, for a long time now, works internationally with um, World Rugby uh, and, and works just under Gilbert and Noke in the New Zealand setup. Uh, the next is Daryl Gibson, former All Black, uh, European player and coach and current coach of the Waratahs. Uh, Jerry Anianatawa is a Fijian born and educated rugby player who played in Australia at the Brumbies and then has t- spent time at Glasgow and representing Fiji. Uh, Carolyn Anderson was a 2004 Olympian in Taekwondo and currently a, uh, a practicing sports psychologist, which she was also uh, studying for and, and uh, practicing during her athletic career. And finally, Adam Miles, uh, who's a first class, class cricketer for Otago Uni, uh, but is a PhD student on life skills and um, one of Ken Hodge. Uh, Ken Hodges' protégés, who is obviously uh, well-versed in this space and life skills space in sport and sports psychology. So all of these people were interviewed presenting uh, in preparation for this presentation, and I'll share some of their views throughout as well. So what are dual pathways? Um, You know, essentially they are the combination of education, training, or work with sport. Um, You know, Dave talks about it as having a pathway outside of, outside of sports that works in harmony uh, and alongside of their sporting careers. While Jerry just talked about it, I guess probably more pragmatically, around building and applying a range of skills outside of sport, uh, while Carolyn you know, talked around that sense of identity and having an alternative identity outside of the sporting arena. So a broad range of kind of combinations there, but overly... You know, the, the gist is of having, I guess, a broader identity to your sport and having something that you're developing, whether it's an identity, whether it's skills, whether it's a career, whether it's work, alongside of sporting career. You know, one of the things we're interested in and in, in being, having been a coach, you know, I think there's a, a maybe a perception that athletes have to focus 100% on what they're doing to perform at their best. Um, And I think some of the questions around dual pathways, and particularly in the minds of athletes as well, is that it may hinder their performance. Um, You know, obviously anything that goes on outside of sport conflicts with quite often rigid competition and training schedules, can be seen as a distraction, something to take an athlete's focus away from the sport that they're putting in. And I think that is quite often a coach's perception, um, either directly the coach's perception of athletes not being concentrating on what they should be, or sometimes uh, it's the perception that the athletes have of the coach, that the the coach will think that of them uh, if they're not concentrating 100% of their time on the sport. Um, You know, Adam kind of made a really good observation in some of the work he's been doing uh, with cricketers in the sense that... um, Sometimes athletes that are working on uh, maybe analytical uh, pursuits outside can either uh, bring that back into their sport and they can become very stuck inside their head, you know, rather than trusting their instincts or relying on their skill, they tend to question a lot of things about what they're doing and what's going on. You know, whilst that definitely has a strength, um, you know, that can be seen potentially as a risk to performance both by the athlete and also by the coach. You know, this is um, Rob Scott. Uh, Rob's an ex-Australian rower, and he's currently CEO of Australia's largest company, Wes Farmers. And, um, you know, one of the great things about Rob's story is he is, uh, you know, rowing very analytical sport. Um, He was studying alongside of that. And a great example of the fact that you can do both at the same time. And talking to Rob, he was in an environment where his uh, his coach was very much a f- only focused on sport coach. And so Rob actually had to develop these skills outside. So even in environments where athletes um, perhaps perceive their coach or in fact their coach is not um, supportive of their dual pathways, it is possible for athletes to succeed at both at the same time. And obviously, Rob's a great example of how it can set athletes up for success after sport. So the performance benefits. 
you know, I think anecdotally, a lot of us, and it goes back to that All Blacks comment around better people make better All Blacks, and it makes sense from a common sense point of view. Um, but there's not a lot of actual research. You know, anecdotally, there's some research definitely from my work with uh, athletes in university settings or even athletes that were um, had other things, whether it be business or um, charity work or some form of identity or skill development outside of rugby. Um, I definitely saw performance benefits, but there is an increasing amount of research being done on this globally um, to support the benefits of dual pathways from a performance sense. Uh, so this is from Dawn uh, Aquilina out of uh, Switzerland in a study of the relationship between elite athletes' educational development and sporting performance. You know, she highlights a range of benefits um, that have both direct relevance in terms of both performance now and also after sport. Uh, the first being that athletes spoke about the fact that it relieved the pressure of performance from sport or academics singularly. So rather than having a single focus, the ability to concentrate on something else relieved the pressure in one specific field. Um, that the skills learned in one area were transfer transferable and valuable to the other that having uh, some intellectual stimulation to accompany the physical challenges of sport help maintain an interest and commitment to their sport and sustain a longer interest over turn. So there's a lot of interest, uh, sorry, research around burnout in sport and around that singular focus on outcomes. And obviously this would support that, that having something else to stimulate them ar around that and outside of that single outcome focus can actually delay burnout onset and prolong careers. Then there's the uh, sense of a more balanced life and particularly, you know, the social comfort in mixing with peers outside of sport. On top of that, you know, I think the performing better with a safety net. Uh, so more and more, I think athletes are aware of the challenges of transition. And even in our time working in this space, we've seen athletes speak to us about going from being worried about the not knowing what they want to do when they finish to actually starting to be worried about having mental health issues when they finish. Uh, and there's definitely not a direct correlation between the two, but the mass media is making that link. And I think athletes are becoming more aware of that concern and that safety net is definitely something that athletes um, can develop through dual pathways. And that leads, sorry, right into, you know, the transition into post-career sport. And finally, just the athletes that were interviewed in, in Dawn's work simply saying that they perform better in an academic environment that is sport-friendly. So here's, I guess, the statistics that back that up from the Olympic movement. So in the recent Olympics, um, so this is 2012 data, but the recent Olympics back this up from Rio as well. So if we look here at the Australian tally, we've got 63% um, of Australia's medals came from university athletes or athletes that had come through a university system and had experienced some form of dual pathway uh, program. At Rio, I think 48% of the Australian squad were made up of student athletes, uh, but they accounted for 68% of the medals in 2016. Uh, the Great Britain team is very similar. Um, and then the American system, which we know is very college-based, is... Oh, wait for a sec, sorry for that. The American system, which we know is very heavily um, university-based, um, has got some amazing stats in the sense that 90% of their Olympic medals come from athletes that have come from a university system. So in terms of the benefits of dual pathways on performance, that's an outstanding statistic. And obviously, there's other contributors there. You know, the best facilities attract the best coaches as well, and, and there are those sorts of performance benefits that I'm sure flow in. But um, we've got to look at also what the actual uh, benefit of the dual pathways impact is. This is the uh, data from Rio from 2016. Um, and we can see here a direct correlation between um, university study or university athletes and actual medal, medal tallies. So if we look at the United States, 
you know, 46 gold medals. And uh, Stanford alone had 11 gold medal athletes. I mean, you take um, University of California, University of Florida, you know, we're getting up to a large percentage of the uh, United States medal tally. For Great Britain, University of Loughborough had six gold medals out of the UK's 27. So we're talking about 20, 25% and up are coming from the leading university systems in the UK and the US. Um, down to Griffith University in Australia, you know, we had three gold medals out of one university, which is almost 50% of our medal tally. And the statistics are similar. You know, Japan again is 25%. Um, and it seems to be a consistent representation across university athletes about having a significant contribution to the performance of their Olympic uh, countries or Olympic medal tallies. So looking at, I guess, rather than just the performance or on-field performance, um, and, you know, there's a lot of work in the UK going on at the moment around, you know, winning at all costs, not being at the best interest of the athlete or the best interest of the long-term performance of the athlete, both within their career and after their sporting career. Um, there's a lot of comments that came out of our interviews around the benefits to the headspace and mental well-being of the athlete. You know, I think... Uh, Carolyn here talks around the fact that it gave her a sense of mental recovery so that perhaps, uh, you know, gave her brain time to heal and reflect and strengthen and just feeling in a better headspace, knowing that she had something else to concentrate on in a way of getting away from her sport. You know, Daryl uh, made the, the observation that um, it's almost essential now that he tries to encourage athletes to have something else going on in their heads so that they keep an active mind as opposed to thinking non-stop around their sport and specifically for him um, was the impact that that had and the belief that without something else on and, and thinking of sport non-stop it had a detrimental effect on their performance you know dave talks just about the, the healthy cognitive and intellectual capabilities of having something more than going on um, and the fact that it tends to freshen the minds of athletes uh, as an anecdotal observation, but, you know, there's more and more of these comments coming around around the benefits for headspace for athletes. You know, Richie, being in New Zealand, obviously, Richie had to make the presentation somewhere, um, but quite often uh, throughout his career, you saw the t dual lives of Richie, and it was Richie on the, on the playing field it was Richie lifting trophies up usually, um, but then it was Richie in gliders, Richie in helicopters, Richie pretending to be a Top Gun ace in this photo. But it was always, and you know, he spoke about being able to, you know, almost that pun of getting, putting his head in the clouds and getting away from rugby. But it was a constant theme throughout his career. And whilst not a, uh, an avid act activist or ambassador of this, inadvertently, you know, he always spoke about that being his time away from rugby that regenerated his ability to come back and perform on the field. You know, Jerry, uh, who I was lucky enough to be involved with coaching throughout some of his journey, you know, um, is a great example of this. I think quite often in sport, you know, we can come up with stereotypes around different athletes, different backgrounds, whatever else. You know, Jerry came uh, through Fiji, educated in Fiji, uh, a lot of pressure in terms of performing um, and, and really wanted to make rugby a success. And throughout his career, uh, as he went, did both undergraduate and then went on to do postgraduate study alongside of competing, he spoke to me around, you know, the last five years of his career with the best performance-wise and also the time when he was doing the most study and had the most going on off the field. He talks around the fact that, you know, it was about managing the stress um, and being able to look after the pressure better than those that didn't do have something else going on off the field. Um, and also just having a clearer head um, and a sense of empowerment that rugby wasn't his only identity. Uh, and the most rewarding thing out of these were not only the performance better but benefits, but also that it just allowed Jerry to enjoy the game more. You know, quite often we hear athletes talk around the game becoming a chore towards the end of their careers or, you know, losing the love of the game. And so 
dual pathways providing that benefit for athletes, a, a massive boost for the athlete and also for, you know, prolonging their career and, and helping them enjoy it. So how can it be supported? I think currently, you know, dual pathways um, are available to athletes and there's definitely an increased support there, but it's not necessarily implemented in the development pathways in a way that it could be. A lot of this has to do with the fact that it's not currently in the performance discussion. You know, high performance coaches um, very rarely, in my experience, talk around the benefits of wellbeing programs or dual pathway programs or education in terms of the benefit it has for the athletes on the field. And I think until we see that change, athletes are always going to listen to the coaches who are selecting them or their senior peers who they aspire to be like and they aspire to achieve the same things that those athletes have achieved. And Dave highlights this by saying, you know, the coaches must genuinely believe in this and they must genuinely prioritise it in their programs. For young athletes and for me being a coach, when, when we brought someone into an academy program at 17 or 18, you know, we taught them what was important from a high-performance um, mindset or high-performance um, program by actually saying weights are important and therefore we have four compulsory weight sessions a week and if you miss one by one minute we'll lock you out of the gym and then you know if you do that more than once then we'll start to talk around disciplinary issues if recovery was important recovery was in the session uh, in the program even if it was on a sunday morning 8 a.m going into a beach and swimming in cold water, it was a compulsory part of that athlete learning the importance of recovery. Um, yet for dual pathways or for um, off-field development, we tend to leave it on the sideline as a voluntary thing for athletes to get in involved in. And very much then the athletes say, well, if it's not in the program, it can't be that important. So some of the implications for the future. Um, the NRL have really made a big push in here and they're working tirelessly to try to improve the outcomes for their athlete and also the outcomes for their sport. There's an interesting stat that Todd Greenberg brought out at the start of this year that now it's somewhere a little over 80% of NRL players are involved in an off-field career development or training. Um, yet the remaining 20% that aren't um, account for 82% of the players that have been investigated by the integrity unit. So whilst that's not a performance equation directly, obviously the ability for athletes to not get into trouble, to not you know, disturb clubs, disturb, distract team members by um, being involved in incidents off the field, indirectly has a massive impact on both their performance and the performance of the team and the club. And there's a really interesting notice or comment from Carolyn here around the younger athletes and, you know, the role we can play for them, where she says, you know, I've noticed with young athletes that they're very clear about their dreams and their aspirations in the sporting world, but pretty much all of them also know that they want to be a doctor, they want to study science, they want to go to university, like they seem to intuitively know that you can do more than one thing. And I think we need to ask ourselves as sports, what are we doing throughout that athlete's development pathway where they no longer believe the fact that they can intuitively do more than just sport? And what role can we play in convincing them that they can be both successful athletes and also uh, successful off the field and developing other aspects of themselves as people? You know, from an employment point of view, you know, if we look at the transition question, uh, David Lavalley from Stirling University, who's done a lot of work in this space, um, has highlighted the fact that the development of student athletes and of those skills throughout the careers actually have a direct impact on the employment of athletes afterwards and therefore their transition experience. So, you know, here it says, you know, if student athletes are able to demonstrate the skills they've learned, developed, and applied. Um, and how these skills transfer to the workplace, they can be more likely to be perceived as highly employable. And I think what we do a lot is we, um, we tell the athletes what these transferable skills are, but perhaps by not supporting them in a way where they can develop them throughout their careers, um, we 
potentially rob them of the ability to actually understand how to specifically articulate them in a way that adds value to their career after sport. Which brings me, I guess, to the, the final few points around is education by itself enough? You know, dual pathways, a lot of dual pathway stuff at the moment, particularly in the university setting, is, is talking around, you know, let's give it an athlete an education. The education itself has some inherent benefits, um, but what are those benefits uh, beyond a piece of paper, essentially? And I think during the career of the athlete, the benefits of the dual pathway athlete or who's developing work or study at the same time um, are evident through the comments and also the research that I've presented. But in terms of the transition specifically, or when an athlete stops doing a dual pathway or completes their degree, sometimes early in their career, you know, is that education by itself enough to prepare the athlete um, throughout their career and, and for afterwards? In 2015, um, the Rugby Union Players Association Australia spent $411,000 on education and training. The AFL Players Association in 2016, $613,000. Uh, and the NRL will spend over $6 million in player welfare and education alone. So we're talking about large amounts of money that are going into the education and training of athletes. Yet we're still seeing a lot of the issues around, um, you know, perhaps transition, uh, athletes struggling for direction, mental well-being, et cetera, et cetera, both during and after their careers. And we, I guess we've got to look at what else can be done to make sure that that dual pathway track doesn't just rely on education alone. I was privileged to talk to and, and hear from um, Julie Richardson and um, Michael Arthur when they presented at the same conference. And they've done some research, interviewing uh, with qualitative research, uh, a whole range of athletes. And they've been looking at some of the broader themes in terms of developing careers after sport. And they've worked out the model, you know, around looking at the formation of social capital, human capital, and psychological capital in terms of how that creates workability and work um, and employability in athletes. And I think there's some really important learnings here that can maybe extend that discussion beyond just education and improve the outcomes for individuals. So social capital uh, essentially refers to that um, value that athletes build up throughout or anyone builds up throughout social connections. And athletes build up a huge amount of this in their sporting environment through the status that their sport uh, allows them and through the, the bonds and the, the value in, they created in those social interactions. But obviously, um, in a dual pathway setting, are we giving athletes the ability to create that same social capital environments outside of sport? Are we allowing them to get into workplaces, to do work experience, to spend time with mentors, to get the confidence and the status and the profile that they have some value there to actually be able to put into work environments. The human capital, I think the education, you know, definitely contributes to a lot and it's a great part of building that human capital, both the hard and the soft skills. Um, and it definitely goes a long way to ticking that human capital box. You know, soft skills perhaps um, could continue to be developed in other settings, but that's largely looked after, I think, by the education programs of sport at the moment. But the final one, psychological capital, I think is another area we can put a lot of more work into. The resilience, hopefulness, optimism, and confidence that um, Julie talks about really comes around being familiar in the setting that you're in, you know, having the uh, confidence and the, the language even, the vocabulary in those settings to be able to be hopeful and optimistic around your ability to advance there, knowing that athletes are quite often starting at the bottom of the ladder. So how do you create social and psychological capital for life after sport? You know, I think the opportunities are networking events, mentoring relationships, the, the more extensive use of alumni networks, use of sponsors in a really personal way, 
uh, and work experience and internships. You know, we do some work with the Hurricanes in, in New Zealand who have got a fantastic setup where they've got an alumni association with all of their past players, coaches, managers, CEOs, board members, and they directly link their athletes on the, the key interests that their athletes have identified so that they can have coffee chats, they can do work experience, they can get mentoring um, either before or after they've gone and got some education so that the education itself isn't the only thing that they're doing to develop both the social and psychological capital for life after sport. You know, quite often sponsors are more than happy to work in this space, but we can generally have a, you know, a broad sponsorship event where we get the whole team or the whole squad into one room and inevitably one or two athletes are interested and the rest of the athletes actually are, are unsure how they can benefit or how they can help the sponsor directly. Whereas if we were able to really identify which athletes had an affinity or a sincere interest in the work of the sponsors and create programs where sponsors looked after or mentored those, mentored those athletes, it could go a long way to creating the confidence, the vocabulary, the resilience in those environments to help athletes make that transition to life after sport. The last model that we looked at with, uh, or Julie presented, was the difference between these three things. And I think, you know, the education at the moment is really looking at the, the knowledge and learning of creating employability and workability uh, capital. So the question is, we've got, I guess, what are we doing to look at the, the knowing or the why of those decisions? and also the whom. So the why and the who is a question that uh, I think we can explore more. And what she talks about was the interdependent relationships between those aspects and the ability for um, both of them to feed on each other. So, you know, knowing why an athlete is doing a certain education, you know, um, can lead to improved performance and create improved engagement and, and learning uh, and also creates that um, reinforcing self-confidence and occupational identity that they're doing the right thing and quite often i think when we just simply pay for education for athletes without spending the time to align it to why it suits them you know we risk losing that engagement and potentially creating self-limiting behaviours where an athlete thinks, well, I don't know why I'm doing this education. I'm just doing it because it's paid for me. I don't really want to do this when I finish. And perhaps that creates a belief that education's not for them and they should just continue focusing on their sport. You know, on top of that, going and creating the relationships, whether they're networking or um, mentoring relationships with areas that specifically interest them, can really refine and reaffirm, you know, athletes knowing why that's important to them. And it may be that through those conversations they identify that it's not for them, but that obviously gets them one step closer to finding the thing they're really interested in. And, you know, putting the time into helping them understand what they're interested in authentically and um, what their identity is really telling them is important to them can actually drive that search for um, career enabling relationships. So the, the three really strengthen each other in more ways than one. And I think as a sporting organization or as a sporting community, we really need to ask ourselves, are we doing just the, the knowledge and learning part through education or are we spending enough time in helping athletes understand why that's important to them individually and then creating the opportunity for them to develop the relationships that gets them to know the who's who in the market they're interested in to reaffirm those interests and maintain that engagement alongside their sporting careers. And so that concludes the presentation. You know, I think it's a fascinating area, obviously, where we're hugely interested in it at the final whistle. And through our experience, you know, really trying to create opportunities around all stages of, of this program or this diagram on the screen. And sports have made huge headways in, in recent years around the well-being of athletes, the education and training of athletes. And I think the outcomes are starting to really accelerate in terms of gaining momentum. 
But I guess we'd challenge all of us to see what can we do more, how can we increase the work that's already been done uh, to really make it more personalised for athletes, more meaningful for athletes, so that individually they know why they're doing it. And because of that, they're more engaged in their learning and they're more motivated to go and search for those relationships that can serve them both now in terms of their performance and also in their transition. Thanks very much.